Good morning. Grace and peace to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wore my voice out singing. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Thank you, Don, for the song. Uh, makes me want to talk about somebody else rather than the current topic. But he's behind it all. Uh, I was just thinking the other night, as I look around at every one of you, you're all sons of God. And uh, the thought came to me, uh, reading a little book on theology, but it's pretty good, I think. And the thought came to me about how we are living now in the in-between. Christ has offered himself, conquered sin in the flesh, raised from the dead. He's the first fruits. But we're still here. And we still have to endure the troubles, the anxieties, the problems. Spread the good news. Spread the word. Rejoice in him. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice but we've not realized the end and final result yet, have we? We don't have that new body. We are in the kingdom, but it's not fully here. And we anticipate that. We're, so we're kind of in between. We know what's going to happen. We are in the kingdom, but there is so much more to come. And so we persevere in the faith. Okay, that was a little bit extra there this morning, but we all need a little boost. And, uh, I'm going to say this now because so, I might forget at the end of the lesson. We'll finish up here talking about the uh, qualities or qualifications for elders, bishops this morning. And then we're going to step back for a couple of weeks and kind of let everyone digest these basically four lessons we've had on leadership. Uh, to pray and to consider uh, if you're a brother, if you would be willing, if nominated, to serve, and also for the congregation to consider, look through your directory, look through the pews in your mind, those men whom you think would be qualified to serve as your shepherd, as your bishop, to lead you in the ways of God. Uh, I know we'll be talking about the, uh, the process and all of this in our, in our ministry meeting. Uh, we're not going to rush through it. We've got, again, the classes which we're working on, getting teachers and all that lined up. I know uh, Mike's got his surgery, so we want to pray for Mike. And, uh, you know, we've got a whole lot of other things going on to, to consume our time this time of year, so just bear with us, but pray, and we'll, we will get there, Lord willing. Okay. Again, we had a handout last week. If you didn't get the handout, there are some left on the counter, and you can pick one of those up on the way out. We'll be working from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 primarily, where we have the two... Uh, lists, if you will, or examples or descriptions of the elder bishop pastor of God's people. And remember, we are uh, judging these men. As we read last time from John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We are evaluating these brothers in comparison to the word of God. And this concerns the man or the brother now, what he is now, not he might, what he might have been years ago, okay? Uh, we can look at that in two different ways. Uh, years ago, he might have been a drunkard and a liar and a worldly guy. But after he met Christ and gave his life to Christ, he's totally changed now. He's a man of God and doing what's right. So it's what he is now. On the other hand, 
someone might have been really involved in the work of the Lord and a re really uh, a spiritual guy, spiritual person years ago, but now not so much. He's cooled off. He's sporadic. Uh, he's not so spiritual. So again, it's what the man has been now and in the recent past, what he is now, this is what we're looking at in these individuals. Okay, I'm going to look a little bit at relationships, how this man deals with and treats other people, or how does he handle disagreements? 1 Timothy 3.3 3 and Titus 1.7, pretty much the same, says he is not pugnacious, but gentle. And the Greek there is the idea, the word pugnacious is he's willing to strike somebody. And this says not pugnacious. In fact, the King James Version there, and uh, I do occasionally look at the King James, uh, I do, says no striker. You know, that's a word we do not use today. In other words, if somebody just willing to reach out, you know, you disagree with me, man, I'm going to pop you. And I even thought from the standpoint of verbal assault, although well, I don't know that's carried with that word, but he's not just one who's wanting to get into arguments and just, to just disagree with people, okay? But he's gentle. Now, this simply means he's under control. That doesn't mean he's a weak person. That doesn't mean he's going to compromise the word of God or give up a position that he knows is right or correct, okay? We don't want to misunderstand that word gentle. But he's not one just to lash out because there is a disagreement with somebody. And I thought of the, the line from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. And this man would be a peacemaker. In fact, that leads us into our next word there in 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. It says he is peaceable. The ESV in the New King James says not quarrelsome. In other words, he's not into winning arguments or getting embroiled in controversies. You know, uh, people can get hot over just about anything. Uh, Shirley can tell you yesterday, I got hot about our internet service. <laughs> uh, I won't get into the details, but I, it upset me. The, uh, what was going on, it wasn't working right, the, the company did something, didn't tell you, whatever. But, you know, we get upset about, uh, you know, what, the Browns, Steelers, or Cowboys, you know, who's the better team, right? Mm -hmm. We can get hot about that. We, we, I was watching a ball game yesterday, and the uh, outcome wasn't good, and it wasn't uh, Michigan, Ohio State either. And uh, I was thinking to myself, why can't we get so excited about the Word of God, about the Lord Jesus and His work, as we do about a football game? Did you ever think about that? Why can't we have the zeal of the Lord? And I don't have a good answer for that. Anyway, and of course, politics, you know, anybody can get fired up about that just at the drop of a hat. But this man's not into winning arguments. But he, he's saving his energy for important topics, for crucial issues, for things that matter, okay? He might disagree with you and say, well, you know, I don't, that's no big deal with me, and I'm not going to get into it with you. So he's not a quarrelsome kind of guy. Titus 1.7, not quick-tempered. He's not easily angered. He does not have the short fuse. Can he get angry? We know Ephesians 4, 6, get angry and not. We can do that. We all have anger, and it serves a purpose at a certain time in a certain place, and we should not always quench that anger. There's indignation. 
we should get upset when things aren't right. And it should move us to do something good. In fact, having a quick temper and reacting always with anger undermines a lot of these other qualities. Uh, do you have Proverbs 16 there on your little handout? Verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. So the scripture is filled with this idea of don't be flying off the handle and at the, you know, you're just any little thing, you're just getting all fired up. He's got to be a person who has self control because uh, he's going to be encountering a lot of things with people, families, marriages, what have you, that are going to get him upset. He sees what's happening with people in their lives. Okay. Now let's look a little bit at family. Both 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 1.6 have the husband of one wife. So this eliminates good faithful sisters and also the unmarried men. And we all know that the formal leadership and authority has been entrusted to the brothers. Uh, that's all through scripture. And so, uh, again, we have this uh, qualification. He is the husband of one wife. The Greek idiom there means the man of one woman or a one-woman man. This means he's married, and he's married to one woman. And, of course, in the day, there, were, there was polygamy. There were concubines and all these things going on. Uh, if you look and read, and I've encouraged you to read all these uh, together as a picture, there's no other word mentioned about sexual immorality. Nothing at all about that. So this, that idea is, is uh, contained in this idea of the one woman man or the man of one woman. The emphasis is on his faithfulness in marriage not simply on the idea that he has been married only one time. Notice it says he is or he must be. It doesn't say he has been the husband of one wife. You see? Otherwise, widowers would be excluded. We know back in the day, a lot of people died early. So it's what he is now. He is married, and we're going to see he has a family. Uh, why, why is this important? I think it shows, you know, first of all, the husband has a leadership position already. He is to be leading his wife and his children in the ways of God. So it's kind of a proving ground or a testing ground. Um, also, it uh, shows how he can get along with his wife. That's a little bit of a proving ground there, right? How well he gets along with his family. Does he love his wife? Does he show that uh, in his life? Are they truly one flesh? Or are they kind of just living separate lives? What's his family life like? And also from the standpoint, uh, you know, he's going to be encountering situations where he needs to counsel those who are married. And uh, it helps a lot to have experience with how to get along with someone else right there in your own life. How to make compromise, how to love, how to forgive, and all those kinds of things. Then carrying on with that idea of the family, 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5. says he manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? You see, that's the idea 
being presented here. He is the leader in his household. He should be managing his household, getting along with his wife. The children are under control. The New King James says, in submission with all reverence. So the home is orderly, financially sound. The needs of everyone is being met. There is respect. The word of God is being applied in that home and lived out. As we have seen, he's a man of God. He holds to the word. So it's not just, you know, when he's in the, in the church building, it's at home as well, in his family, with his wife, and with his children. It doesn't say about how many children. So, uh, you know, some people argue a man only has one child doesn't qualify, but I, I don't see that as, as being viable objection. Uh, because we always talk about whoever, who has children and somebody with one child will raise their hand, right? So I don't think uh, the plurality here is something to be, uh, be concerned about. He does correct, train, and discipline his kids. Uh, Ephesians 6.4, the fathers are charged, right? Bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They have the ultimate responsibility because they are the head of the house. They are the leader. And even though, you know, mom might be the one that interacts more with the child than the father, he is to interact as well and be responsible for what is taught and the discipline and the training of the kids. Another thing to think about here, you know, if, if he's talking about children... This tells us that elders aren't necessarily 70 and 80 years old, right? If he has, still has kids in his home for which he's responsible. So just the age factor is just not, uh, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit before about elder. Uh, it carries with it the idea of maturity more than age. Okay, Titus 1.6. Now in Titus, uh, at least in the New American Standard, it says having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Now the New King James there still has, says faithful children. Now the word dissipation means wasteful pursuits and riotous living. So I was trying to balance these two out, okay? Because we want to think about this. The, the instructions in Timothy were given to Timothy, and it's uh, widely believed that he was in Ephesus when this was going on. That he was there, and this is where he was to, uh, to put the elders in place. So Timothy had what was given to him, and Titus, it's, it plainly tells us there in the first part of Titus that he was in Crete. And this was the list given to him about setting the elders in place. And so there would not be any conflict among these two. Now, we, we have them both to look at, and we're thankful for that. But Paul is talking about the same, the same office and the same people, elders. So you wouldn't want to have them conflict. What I'm, I'm talking about here, you know, we could argue about children who believe or faithful children. The word there in the Greek can mean the, both those things. It can mean someone who believes, or it can just mean someone who is faithful and trustworthy. And to me, that better fits what was written to Timothy about having the children under control in the house they're being trained and disciplined. Now, certainly, a man who is a man of God is teaching his children about Christ, teaching them the gospel as they're being reared, those children are going to believe and obey the gospel. I agree with that. Does that mean every last one will? I don't know. You know, we could d debate this, as we say, until the cows come home. But he's going to have that influence on those children, and I'm sure that many of them will 
become believers. But as we just noted, you know, maybe he's still got a four and five year old in his house. Ten year old, you know, they're not going to be believers. So we got to look at this with God's wisdom about what, what is the situation here. He's a man of God. He's rearing his children in the ways of the Lord. They're not, they're not running wild. They're not doing crazy things. They are being taught the word of God. And we would expect that many of his kids, as they grow of age, would obey the gospel. Okay. Reputation. 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 1.7, very similar. Must be above reproach. That, mean, that word means shameful or disgraceful in something. In one sense, all the rest would define that if we would look at that whole picture. There is no outstanding sin or glaring fault. We could say, you know, he's a great guy, but man, he just can't control his temper. Everything else is good, but this. We just can't count on him when there's something going on. He's just never there. He's above reproach. We can't, we can't really point at any one thing and say, he, he's really weak in this area, okay? Now, this doesn't mean, again, we're not talking sinless, perfection, and that kind of thing. But this man is a man of God. He's reliable, and, and you can't look at him and say, wow, he's got this flaw. He doesn't have a flaw, so to speak. 1 Timothy 3, 7. Have a good reputation with those outside the church. All right, this tells me he's known, at least in his community, in his neighborhood. Um, I mean, it's not one of these, you know, when he comes in the church building, he's a saint. He's well-behaved, you know, he, did, he says the prayers and does the readings and all that. But he's a different guy at home. He's a different guy in the workplace or whatever. He's not like that. He's through and through. He's a man of God. He follows the word. He walks with God wherever he goes. He has a good reputation. Service. Titus 1.7 talks about him. He's going to accept this position as God's steward. We've seen, I think, already that he is a steward of what God has entrusted him with, his own life, his wife, his children, and what all God has given to him. And now he knows if he takes this position or this office, this work, even more is going to be entrusted to him by God to lead the congregation, to shepherd the flock. He understands that this is God's work, and this is God's, if God's given to him this opportunity, this responsibility, and he's, he understands he'll, he'll answer to God for it. Hospitable, both in 1 Timothy 3.2 and Titus 1.8 literally means a love of strangers. He's open to helping those in need. He welcomes people into his home. He's just that kind of a person. When he sees a need, we would, I think we would say, that he's willing to, to address that need. He doesn't turn away from that. Uh, we might say he has an open home and an open wallet when there is a need, sees a need. And then the last one is one we have already pretty much addressed. I'm not going to dwell on it. Able to teach, 1 Timothy 3.2. And then Titus 1.9 has be able to exhort in sound doctrine to refute those who contradict. And he has that demonstrated ability somewhere. Uh, whether it's in a class, one-on-one. -on -one, maybe he's filled in the pulpit from time to time. But he knows that word of God. He believes that is the word of the Bible is the word of God. 
It's, uh, he's living it, he's following it, he's teaching it at home, he's able to teach it in other settings. He knows that word. Uh, in fact, let's go to Titus 1.9. Paul follow, follows up here with Timothy uh, as to why this was important, at least where, uh, where Titus was in Crete. Let's do uh, verse Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so he'll be able both to exhort, and that is that word to encourage the church in sound doctrine, and to refute those who contradict. We looked at that idea from the standpoint of you know, the wolves coming in among the flock. Paul, uh, Paul talked about that idea to the elders there at Ephesus. Uh, we had that one of our earlier lessons. That the savage wolves would come in, try to destroy the flock, mainly by false teaching. Mainly by telling lies and deceitful thoughts and philosophies of men and myths and all that. Now, verse 10, for, okay, or because, you see, why is that important? Because there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. That was a problem in the day, trying to get the church to go back under, or at least in part, follow the law of Moses who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So there you have it. The elder must have the gumption, the guts, the spiritual zeal and love for God and for his people to stand up against those who would teach falsehood, teach lies. Why? Because they destroy family, they lead people away from God. And he doesn't want to see that happen. So uh, we can see there, you know, part of the reason or the main reason why this man has to know the word of God and to be willing to stand up and refute some who would come in and start speaking things that are not in accordance with the will of God. So it's a challenge. Okay, that's kind of a wrap on all that. And again, I say, if you need the handout, there's one back there for you to peruse. Read these over, maybe even in a couple different translations. Think about the brothers, pray, and we'll be, we'll be moving forward with this in the days of the head, Lord willing. And uh, we just appreciate your patience with that with all this that's going on. We need your prayers. God bless you today.